Welcome to the MUFG Global Markets Podcast. I'm John Cook, and I'm joined today by George Goncalves, MUFG's head of U.S. macro strategy. It's Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. Welcome back to the podcast, George. Great to be back on, John. Yeah, good to have you. Uh, so 2003, 2023 is starting to look like a mirror opposite of the end of 2022. Uh, one could argue that the recent strong returns in risk assets suggest a pretty significant shift in sentiment. I'm curious how you're perceiving things, George. No, it's been a, a real you know, change of fortunes for sure. Um, you know, you know, for for you know, looking at it uh, high level and and down, you know, markets are climbing the wall of worry that were clearly built in 2022. And and, and to me, you know, I think the markets are is, is hopeful that we we probably are going to hopefully avoid the worst case scenario. Uh, and, and that's really on a, on a global basis. But I'll come back to those two points and, and compare like what you know matters for the U.S. versus the rest of the world. But it's it's looking like you know more and more likely that this is just another bear market rally, uh, and and it's influencing the sentiment on the back end of it. And you know it's been you know really aided and abetted, I think, by positioning you know, a big short base again, uh, and just, you know, and many different asset classes that were just under investment over the course of 2022 as that, you know, which was a kind of a grinding bear market, but not the cathartic bear market that we've seen in, in recent history. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, people have been underinvested. It's the beginning of a new year that always typically brings in new, uh, you know, annual inflows. And not to mention once, you know, kind of the ball starts rolling, you kind of get this FOMO or fear of missing out and then you get you know a further involvement by investors. And I think that's it's really this kind of circular kind of argument that's going on here that just because markets are pricing in a better outcome or that they've you know, actually produced returns versus losses what they saw throughout last year, that people are extrapolating that that this is indeed a kind of a final turn. And you know, like the the, the catalysts are numerous, but there are really three that have led to this U turn in the markets. The first one really being inflation has peaked and we're seeing again, further evidence that it's declining and that it will further slide. And that relative to you know, growth slowing means that central banks are probably closer to the end and perhaps we can actually get a soft landing. So that, that's the that's the one big overarching kind of narrative story that's out there. The second, which is really more related to Europe has been that they've experienced you know, better, better weather and that the, a warmer Europe has you know, lower their you know their energy costs. You know they're really uh, trying to scrape by as best they can with uh, what resources they have, uh, and it's really you know most likely going to you know uh, pull them out or prevent them from getting into a really deep recession. They have the real risk of falling into a, a much much deeper recession uh, in Europe. And I think you know we can split hairs if they're going to be growing at you know zero point one or nothing. I mean basically you know they're going to be close to stall speed or if not in a recession. Thing is, it's probably not the worst case scenario for Europe, at least for now. And the third one uh, is, you know, this China reopening narrative and how it's going to be a positive tailwind for all economies. The thing is, like, you know, the two, of, like, well, one of those is a fact, and two of them are opinions. And and the only fact is that yes, nature has been kind, and the other two are just narratives, which are up against you know, the, the the long and um, variable lags of tightening which the Fed has you know, put in place in 2022, and the ECB is still putting in place as we speak. And uh, and there's still the risk of what the Bank of Japan may still do in the coming quarter. So I think the markets are getting ahead of themselves. And this kind of um, you know, prevailing force of tightening that it has still, you know, it's still working its way through the, the, the broader US financial system and global system, given that the dollar is so important. I think it's still too early to kind of extrapolate that you know the, the performance of January is going to be indicative of the full year. So I'm I'm still of the view that this is going to be fair. And George, repeat repeat your conclusion there because it just you just cut out for a second. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess at the end is that I still think that this is a ultimately will be another bear market rally as we make a try to make a low and and really figure out uh, where we are in the in the cycle. And I think it's, it's still early days to extrapolate. Yeah, and I'm very sympathetic uh, to that. I'm very sympathetic sympathetic to that view. I mean, uh, you know, I would argue that um, 
you know, that the central banks, you know, particularly the Fed and the ECB, but also the BOJ, as, as you mentioned, have been, you know, have been pretty, you know, pretty hawkish. Um, and, and it just feels a little bit early. But, you know, alas, in rates, we've seen yet again, another failed set off, sell off. Um, you know, and moreover, at this point, the entire yield curve is trading deeply through Fed funds, you know, and that's spot Fed funds, you know, we're almost, you know, certain that the Fed's going to raise 25 basis points next meeting, certainly highly, maybe not highly likely, but very possible they raise, you know, another time, you know, so, so, you know, deeply through Fed funds now, let alone where Fed funds will be in February or next quarter, um, you know, given what you laid out for us in the, in your first answer with the strong performance and risk assets, you know, what are listeners supposed to make of the U S rates complex, you know, juxtaposed against that, as well as this hawkish Fed, you know, speak that you highlight. Yeah, in a way, there's a whole host of inconsistencies happening with what is being conveyed by the rates market versus other assets. But in a way, the, these other asset classes really need low rates in order to be attractive or to kind of you know, justify this whole valuation story and the discount factor phenomenon of lower rates, i.e. going back to the way things used to be of like lower rates and just easy money is going to come back and central banks are going to bail out the system. I mean, I think there's a there's an element of that kind of, uh, you know, in the background, still influencing some some decisions uh, on the investor level that somehow, you know, if Fed, if Fed does too much or we do fall into recession that therefore they're going to come out and ease aggressively. And that somehow it's going to you know, you know, counterbalance financial assets. And therefore, you know, investors now are going to look through everything, look through if we do go into a recession or not, look through at the fact that the Fed's going to have rates at 5% and stay on hold for as long as possible, look through the fact that they're doing quantitative tightening and maybe might tweak it to get even more aggressive to try to really drain liquidity. I mean, the, like, it, it's really, again, we're in the narrative part. I think the beginning of the year, there's a lot of e e euphoria. And of course, this price action has helped kind of uh, kind of support that, um, but the rates market, you know, with a deeply inverted curve, as you as you described uh, across you know, all tenors, uh, there's a healthy level of skepticism, and that's and, and that's fine. But you know, at some point, negative carry does matter, and so the Fed gets rates up to let's say close to five percent, um, you know, you know somewhere, somewhere between you know four and seven eighths and five and an eighth. Let's say they're close to five, and then it really comes down to what you know, has them start to cut, right? I mean, something materially has to change on the economic uh, front, and that's probably the jobs market. Um, meanwhile, um, you, know, the, you know, we're, you know, we should have some sort of beta to the, the rise in rates coming uh, in this upcoming meeting. Uh, and when the Fed raises rates next next meeting, which we think they'll, you know, deliver 25, I think it will be a hawkish 25. Remember, every single uh, Fed meeting since, August Jackson Hole of last year, even after inflation has peaked and has been declining all throughout this last six months, you know, Chair Powell comes out pretty hawkish. And the and the main reason, even at the December meeting, when they downgraded from 75 to 50, which again, they're going to downgrade again from 50 to 25. And that could be viewed as, as, as dovish, but they're still tightening and, and raising rates. And, and they're taking into account the cumulative effect of all their hikes. They're trying to deliver a message that that you know financial conditions has to tighten they've been easing for the last six weeks or the last three weeks uh but remember in the you know after the december meeting we actually had a decent sell-off in rates of about you know 30 to 40 basis points we had equities also decline during that time period so every time chair Powell, chair Powell comes out and speaks after delivering um the you know the, the message and, and the decision uh, typically, the markets kind of wake up and realize, well, the Fed is not truly done, nor are they close to even cutting, right? So that the market then kind of has another rethink, and we kind of head head back lower again. I think we'll have a, a slight repeat of that um, uh, next next week when the Fed meets. I'll be more curious to, to see if there's any mention about adjustments to the Fed, Fed's balance sheet policies and what they're going to do with that going forward, both for how they manage the liquidity side or the liability side. With RRP versus reserves, there's been some discussions around that. So I think that that's going to be in the more interesting part because I think quantitative tightening is really what's going to, you know, really bite and take out liquidity from the markets, um, and that plus the high level of rates. So I think that's where the Fed is uh, at this point. I think they want to they want to use the, all their tools, even though they're going to go slower in hikes, and that might be like, viewed as dovish, but it might be a hawkish 25. 
because he's going to deliver a really powerful message that they're not trying to ease financial conditions. They're trying to do, to do the opposite. Yeah, great point. I mean, financial the recent financial condition easing ironically makes it much more likely the Fed follows through with keeping rates higher at elevated levels as they've told us. So pretty, you know, longer. And, yeah, longer too. yeah, exactly. So just a, as you as you laid out in the outset to that answer, you know, a lot of inconsistencies here. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about the Fed. You sort of gave us a, a very brief preview. Um, I know you recently contributed to the MEFG Global Markets Monthly. Um, and uh, I haven't seen the piece yet, but I suspect there's a nice, uh, nice FOMC meeting preview in there. Um, why don't you give our listeners a, um, a you know, the highlights of uh, what you expect from the Fed next week, especially, especially, you know, or in the context of, you know, this backdrop that you've laid out for us. Yeah. And again, not, not to repeat, I guess kind of answered some of that point, these points in the, in the, in the second question. Um, it's the first start of the year. It's the first meeting where they set the agenda and they kind of rethink and they look at their models. It's a, it's kind of this period to kind of reflect on what they've done in the, in the past. And let's remember they did, Within seven meetings, 425 basis points, some of the fastest hikes in modern day, you know, you know, central banking for, for the Fed, at least. Um, and so I think that they're going to, you know, emphasize that, you know, their prior actions are still working their way through the system, as, as I, you know, we all kind of know. And I think that they have to make that point clear. Uh, they're going to, of course, slow down the, the, the hikes. But again, there's always a, a we can, the market's pricing in a zero percent probability of fifty basis point, and 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 it'll be very rare for the for for the Fed not to deliver that. But you know, is it a, is it a one percent risk? Is it a zero point five percent risk? I mean, there's always a risk that there's that the, that the Fed might look up and say like, why is the market not realizing that we want tighter financial conditions and they're going the opposite way? So, I mean, that would be uber hawkish if they were to do fifty. Again, not my base case, uh, but I mean, I think that hawkish twenty five. Is what they're going to be going after, uh, and then uh, it will be interesting to see the sort of questions that are are, are asked of of of, of, um, of Chair Powell. I mean, yes, inflation is heading lower. But we don't get we don't get the um, the summary of economic projection updates, so we're not going to get a, a a reset of like what their thinking is on the economy uh, in terms of like their actual forecast or, or their median expectations. But um, we do. Uh, I would expect you know, the the press to kind of start to ask about those questions, uh, like where is the kind of crossover point for inflation versus the level of Fed funds, and it's not there yet. I mean, so we're at least two hundred basis points uh, away from that, and, and that means that inflation has to come down at least by two percent or more to kind of get to a point where they can say, "Hey, we're really being restrictive." If you if you look at um, you know like proxy Fed funds rates, which um, was put out by the San Francisco Fed, which suggests that maybe rates are actually equivalent of like six percent right now versus the you know the four uh, the four four and a half that we're at now. I mean, like the the idea could be that you know fine, we're 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 we've seen a lot of other forms of interest rate rises throughout the broader economy, but even at that level, we're still not we're still in a negative real Fed funds. So we've had negative real Fed funds all throughout this dramatic rise in rates. It's only when we see real Fed funds flip to a positive Fed funds, which, you know, based on the trajectory for inflation, should happen by the middle of the year. But then again, like if we just spend one quarter at positive real rates, is that enough tightening, given how much excess liquidity is out there, and we we see it in the way that there's excess liquidity chasing assets. Uh, so I don't know. I feel like they 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 they're gonna stick to their knitting around being hawkish. They're not, just because they're slowing down doesn't mean they're actually bowing out. They're actually gonna stay very restrictive at a very high level of rate. And then you know we'll see if there's any questions around quantitative tightening in the balance sheet. I mean, for the last couple of um, um, press conferences, I don't recall uh, actual anyone really asking uh, Chair Powell about the balance sheet or really kind of doing a real you know deep dive into the balance sheet. I mean, I think if there's, you know, further discussions on the balance sheet and that they're they're looking at ways to enhance it, I think that will be the, the big surprise. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, some chatter on the balance sheet has picked up a little bit here. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, I guess what I would say is to our listeners, I would encourage you to uh, you know, when if you're looking for more on the what to expect for the February FOMC meeting, I would encourage you to check out the January Global Markets Monthly, uh, which should be out, you know, around the time of this podcast drops. And if you aren't receiving receiving George's strategy reports, please do get in contact with him directly. Great stuff as always. Thanks again, George. 
Thank you, John. And thank you for listening to the MUFG Global Markets Podcast. Rate, review, and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And reach out to your MUFG sales rep for any further information. Check back soon for more insights from the Global Markets Research Team. 